We are going to break with precedent this morning out of respect for the sanctity of God's Word and ask you to stand for the reading of the Scripture. It's a very long reading, so I thought if you stood, that might be a good idea too. We're reading from Matthew 16, starting at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some said John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed art you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to follow and become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then, then, he will repay everyone for what he has done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to, appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, 
This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up! Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. It's uh, good to be at uh, another college chapel. I, I get a privilege uh, to speak sometimes in college chapels. Wheaton does it right. I was at a college I can't name, though, a little while ago, and, well, the, the opening of the service was not great. Um, cha the chaplain clearly was having an off day. Um, Chap BK apparently never has an off day, but mortals do. <laughs> and this chaplain was clearly having an off day. He had come to this chapel, the students had filed in, and he had very little to have before the speaker, which was your servant. But what he did have was a little DVD. And he'd had the tech guys run the DVD, and he said, um, I, I, I didn't uh, prepare as much as I usually do for today, but I got this in the mail yesterday, and I know that you'll be blessed by it. I'm thinking, oh, oh great, this is going to tie in so well uh, to the theme of my talk. And up on these two monitors comes a beautiful little home video of a three-year-old girl stumbling around her parents' living room, and they finally get her attention. And it's his niece, and that's, that's the connection. It's his niece, he's nuts about her, and she sings this little song, and it's about, I don't know, she's a caterpillar for Jesus or something, and <laughs> I'm thinking, this, this, this is going from bad to worse. I can never work with children or animals, right? And uh, she's, she's adorable, I'm obviously not so adorable, and she's cute, and she finishes with how she's going to be the butterfly God wants her to be, or anything. And then, and then now it's time for middle-aged Professor Boring Man. <laughs> Great. And I get on and try to do my thing. So I was very glad that the chaplain put his heart into this morning, even if he had to compel relatives of mine to participate. <laughs> Thank you to Josh and to Sindra, and especially to John for reading uh, scripture the way the apostles read it, with a proper English accent. <laughs> as, we, as we know, we know from watching movies, everybody in ancient lands spoke in an English accent. <laughs> Except Vikings and Spartans, who were apparently Scottish. <laughs> but thank you, John, for that authentic reading. Good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. <laughs> and in that text this morning, we encounter in Jesus' ministry, things have he heated up quite a bit. John the Baptist has been killed for his straightforward witness. Jesus is ramping up the miracles. He's fed uh, thousands of people. He has walked on water and helped Peter do the same. He has uh, commanded the demons to leave uh, a young girl. And the disciples are in a pitch of confusion and excitement. Who is this guy? Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this one who has authority even over the spirit world? Who is this one who can multiply food? Who is this guy? And Jesus turns the question back. He says, well, who do people say that I am? Oh, they're very excited, the, the, the disciples say. They're very excited. They, they think, they think you're, you're John the Baptist or, or maybe, maybe Elijah or, or, or maybe uh, Jeremiah. And they're, they're reaching for the top drawers of the Jewish, Jewish Bureau of, of Adjectives and Metaphors, right? You're, you're the best we've ever seen. And Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, always glad for an opportunity to share, Peter says, 
you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And the disciples look at him, stunned. <laughs> he might have gotten one right. And Jesus says, yes, blessed are you. Now, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say, congratulations, Peter. You have clearly marshaled the appropriate scriptural evidence, put it together with the data that you've seen, and inferred the appropriate conclusion. No, he, had this. he doesn't say that to Peter. Why? Because uh, I think there is no way to come to the conclusion that this carpenter come rabbi is actually the son of God and the Messiah of Israel unless you have it shown to you. I don't think you can be argued into it. I don't think we can argue other people into it. I think it has to come to people the way it comes to Peter. Blessed are you, gifted are you, Jesus says, for flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. This isn't something you can infer. This is something my heavenly Father has shown you. Then Jesus goes on to say, don't tell anybody about this, which is not the first evangelistic strategy you learn at Wheaton College. In fact, this, it seems a very odd thing to say. Peter finally has one right. He'd actually like to share that. I got one right. I got one right. Jesus really, no, don't tell anybody. In fact, at that point, and from then on, the scripture says, Jesus ties his messiahship to suffering and death. He connects the two, which hadn't been fused before in the Jewish mind. And it says, and from then on, Jesus begins to say that the messiah must suffer. The Messiah is supposed to actually not suffer. The Messiah is supposed to make other people suffer. The Messiah is supposed to make Rome suffer. And Jesus says, no, now that you've got the idea that I'm the Messiah of God, he connects that idea with suffering and death. And Peter, like any good Jew, finds that intolerable. This is nonsense. This is absolutely the wrong idea. If the Messiah is going to suffer, then no one will save us. He will not be the true Messiah. This must be wrong. And Jesus, who had just congratulated him on his spiritual insight, promising to build the church on that kind of faith, then says, get behind me, Satan. Peter's having a strange day. <laughs> just a few minutes ago, he's being commended as the rock in which the church will be built, and now he's the devil. Why? Because he said, Jesus says, you're, you're doing exactly what human beings would do. That's, that is a sensible reaction from a human point of view. But that's not the will of God. That's not what God is doing. And Jesus goes on to say, not only am I going to suffer, but you are too. It's just getting better and better. Right? You're going to have to suffer as well. But this is part of what God is doing to bring the world to himself, to bring salvation to the world, to bring the glory of God so that it will be manifest. This is a lot to chew on. And six days later, Jesus takes his inner circle up the mountainside. And there he is transfigured. And there, for once, it's as if who Jesus is starts to really show. In the Bible, we see glows, we see uh, light shining when the glory of God is present in the Old and the New Testament. The sense that, that God who is light, once God is present, things start to be, as it were, irradiated with God's light. And Jesus begins to glow. His face shines like the sun, and we get the hint that his whole body actually is shining like the sun, so that even his garments are glowing. Now, I, I find it striking, actually, that, that this is an exception to the rule because in most of the pictures of Jesus I had in my Sunday school papers growing up, Jesus is already glowing, right? His robe's already brilliant white and blue sash. You can see him at 400 yards away. Yep, there's Jesus. That's the one with the day glow robe. <laughs> but here he is glowing and his robe is glowing because it's as if his essence is finally being shown. And there's suddenly Moses and Elijah. The law and the prophets personified and they're talking with Jesus as if Jesus belongs with them. And the disciples say, our guy's there. Look, our guy, our rabbi is hanging with Moses and Elijah. This is unbelievable. And, and Peter, always quick to share, comes forward and says, I, 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 th 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 this is great, Lord, that, that, that you're here and, and, and Moses and, and, and Elijah. And, and, and let me see if I can, what can I do for you guys? Maybe I can build you a little tent. It's hot out here. Uh, maybe I'll put a little uh, tabernacles for you. 
and one of the other gospels says, for he did not know what he was saying. <laughs> let, me, let me just do something for you here. And as Peter is making three tents, God the Father says, no, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Which is an extraordinary thing for God to say in the presence of Moses and Elijah, isn't it? The law and the prophets are there, but this is my son. Listen to him. They fall on their faces, and when they look up, Jesus says, don't be afraid, and it's just him left. They have seen Jesus now not just as the Messiah of God, but something more. It's going to take uh, a lot of theology to figure out just what they've seen and who this Jesus is, but they realize now this, this isn't just a prophet. This isn't just an angel. It's not even just a Messiah. Jesus is the very Son of God. And Jesus says the same thing to them. Don't tell anybody what you've seen till later. Why? Because Jesus knows that if the disciples start talking about Jesus as Messiah too quickly, if they start saying, and he's not just Messiah, he's, he's like an alien, he's, he glows, he's, he's not of this world, that's going to blow Jesus' mission. Jesus has to stay incognito. Jesus has to look like a regular guy. In fact, Jesus looks like such a regular guy that when it comes time to arrest him, even though he's been teaching freely in the temple, when it comes time to arrest him, Judas has to work it out with the soldiers. The guy I kiss is the guy you take. Which is not the way Jesus is pictured on Christmas cards, because in Christmas cards, he's glowing in the dark, right? In the manger. And if Jesus kept that healthy glow all his life, <laughs> then in Gethsemane, he's just follow the glow Arrest it. <laughs> You're done. But Isaiah 53 says he had no form or comeliness. He had nothing striking about him. Jesus was literally nondescript in appearance. On purpose. Because that's what he needed to be to get done the job that God wanted him to do. So in addressing our question this morning, why did God not make you more beautiful than you are? A question that you might have asked yourself already this morning, perhaps in front of the mirror. I know I did. <laughs> addressing this question, because this is Wheaton College and not just Wheaton Bible School, we want to we wanna bring together now the Bible and another great text of Western literature. So we, we have some, some biblical work and we have some work from the culture. And if I were John Walford, I could refer to some great works of the history of, of the graphic arts. Or if I were Alan Jacobs, I could take you to the English literature. But being who I am, we move now from the Bible to the James Bond movies. <laughs> now, as a Christian, I've never seen a James Bond movie. <laughs> Okay, I've seen a couple, but just as part of my cultural research. <laughs> well, that, that's what you call it, isn't it? Yeah. So, so as part of my cultural research into the James Bond movie phenomenon, one of the many implausibilities of this extremely implausible movie sequence is actually the casting of the hero James Bond. Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan. And who's the most recent guy? Yeah, you're not supposed to know that, but yes, it is. <laughs> da Daniel Craig. Now, now here, here's what's obviously patently wrong about this casting, is that when Sean Connery or Pierce Brosnan walk into the room, everybody looks. The guy's drop-dead handsome, and he's supposed to be a secret agent. <laughs> the secret lasts five seconds. Everybody sees him. That's the guy. Now, I, on the other hand, <laughs> I walk into a room, nobody notices, nobody cares. You know, I, I steal the secrets, I steal the girl, I steal the silver, I'm gone, nobody knows. <laughs> I would totally rock as a secret agent, you know. The name is Stackhouse, John Stackhouse. <laughs> 
Because that's what real spies do. Real agents take on a persona, right? They, they, they clothe themselves in some kind of disguise to get the job done. It might be a glamorous job. It might be a wonderful Riviera-type posting, or it might be stuck somewhere uh, in, a, in a really unlucky, unhealthy situation. They take on the persona. They have the legend. They have the papers. They play who they need to play in order to get the job done that they need to do. And God wants the whole world back, not just the glamorous parts. And so he needs to send us everywhere, at all stages, and all places of society. He loves everybody and everybody he wants to draw to himself, so he has to deploy his agents and equip them properly in order to play the roles they are supposed to play. And so God fits us with both our strengths and our limitations. You see, if you were too beautiful, if you were more beautiful than you are now, you would be unfit for your job. If you were more beautiful than you are now, you would just be distracting, right? Nobody could get any work done around you <laughs> if you were any more beautiful than you are now. Have you ever actually tried to work or, or, or otherwise be around somebody who's truly beautiful? I mean, you just, you, just, you know, you keep mistyping and, and, and doing the wrong, because you keep, you just distract, distracted. The only thing you can do, by the way, when you're around somebody that beautiful is to marry them. <laughs> Which is what my wife did. <laughs> Your laughter wounds me. <laughs> Okay, 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 just kidding about that part. <laughs> but seriously, you, you, you can't be around people who are just dazzling. They've got to have their colors toned down. They've got to play the role they're supposed to play. And that's why God has not made you more beautiful than you are or more intelligent than you are or more musical than you are or more popular than you are. And I think we have to really take this in and we have to keep taking it in because lurking around us Lurking in the bushes is always the temptation to believe that God is screwing up my life, that God has under-resourced me, that God really hasn't run my life very well. And so far, it might look pretty good at Wheaton College, but I know a lot of you are struggling with that right now. And you know what? You're going to keep struggling with it because everybody in this room struggles with that from freshman to president, from new to old, from young to senior, we all have that temptation arise from time to time to think, you know what, God's not coming through for me. He's not deploying me where he should. He's not giving me the life I really wanted. I could do so much more if he would just. And this is what it really means to have faith, to trust your boss, to trust your superior. We have to play the role we're given and understand that that's a good role and God hasn't made a mistake in giving it to us. In contemporary theology, there is a fair bit of talk around the dramatic arts as a metaphor for life. C.S. Lewis talked about us playing out our parts in, in the multi-act drama of life. Uh, Tom Wright has talked about this. Kevin Van Hooser, with his marvelous industries, made a whole book uh, with this uh, as his theme. And there's a lot of good to be drawn from the idea of drama as metaphor for life. But you know, I would also respectfully say we need to go a little farther, maybe a lot farther. Because you know what? We're not just actors on a stage. It isn't just make-believe. It's real. And so I tend to use the metaphor, not that we are acting as actors on a stage, but we are acting as agents in the real world on assignment from God. Each of us is given a mission, an identity, a disguise, a set of limitations, a set of social relationships, and God says, I'm deploying you here for now. Do this. This is what I want you to do here. Later, I'm going to move you. That'll be your next mission, and then there'll be one or two more, and then I'm calling you home. But for now, be a good soldier. For now, play the mission. And good spies don't worry about that. Good agents say, yeah, this, this is, I don't mind playing this for a while, because it's not forever. It's just for the next 50 or 60 years. It's just for the next 50 or 60 years, and then I get to go home. And then the, the beautiful person that you have wanted to be comes out, and, and everybody can see it. When Nicole Kidman 
came onto the scene as an actress, everybody knew, you take one look at her, this is one beautiful woman. But can she act? And she had to put on a, a big nose and, and drop her voice down and almost drop all of her colors down to play Virginia Woolf. And then we could see, yeah, yeah, she really can act, right? Remember that? Charlize Theron has to tone down her beauty to play a monster. And then we say, yeah, that's a woman who deserves an Academy Award. But on the Academy Awards night, Nicole, Charlize, they come on the red carpet and they are in their glory because the acting's done, the role's played, and now they can be truly who they are. So if you sense inside that you're actually more beautiful than you look, you're right, you are. You're just in disguise right now. And if you think you're more talented than you are, if you think that you aspire to being more skillful than you are, good for you. God says those are good aspirations. Someday you will be everything you can be, but for now, trust that God has not under-resourced you. Because you know what? There's always somebody prettier, right? There's always somebody smarter. There's always somebody more talented, always somebody more popular. And if you don't get to grips with that, you will spend a lot of your life really unhappy because there's no disease that eats you up worse than envy. But envy's great antidote is faith, that God has not made a mistake with you, that God has made you just how he needs you to be, be the best version of yourself you can be, play your role, finish your mission. And then, and then, when your mission's done, and God calls you back to station and rewards you, then, on that great day, you no longer have to be a caterpillar for Jesus, but you can be the butterfly God always made you to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.